Very good evening, everybody. 6th of June. It's Saturday evening. Conversations from lockdown with myself, Aidan, brought to you by Kalami Park Equestrian Club in association with Mumpro SA and I4 Williams Trailers. And uh, my guest this evening, coming from uh, from his home, is Govert Triggle. Govert, been looking forward to this interview. How are you? I'm good and you, Aidan. Excellent, excellent. Tell me about lockdown. How's it treated you? Um, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, we've focused on some stuff that it needed to in the business. You know, it's obvious uh, in some of the businesses it's easier um, during a time like this because you don't have pressure from the customers where you're forced to um, close your doors. Um, the other business, uh, the water business has been flat out because we're an essential service. So um, that hasn't been affected by lockdown. Um, on the horse front, it's been a little bit difficult to stay motivated without a show mm. um, to aim towards. But uh, I think the young horses have benefited greatly by it. So, yeah, all around, we may, we may do keep going forward. Now, Rionet, your company, obviously is a huge sponsor in the, in the equestrian game. Um, let's take this opportunity just to uh, tell people about Rionet, what you do, what you offer. So, Rionet's in the utility um, game, uh, water lights, uh, sewer, refuse, uh, rates, property rates and taxes. Um, we, our clients are uh, typically clients that have a big spend in any one of those uh, utilities. And our business model is one where we um, agree with the customer that they are spending X, uh, we come in with various interventions and we reduce it to Y. And we share in the difference between X and Y. At the same, we take a percentage of uh, the difference between X and Y. So we invest all the capital, we take all the risk up front, and the customer is only in a better position for it. Um, the majority of our customer base is uh, obviously state-owned uh, buildings because it is, um, it's really needed there. Um, because their the budgets are continuously shrinking and therefore um, they've become uh, the major part of our portfolio. And you mentioned, Govett, the water business a moment ago. Is that part of Rionet or is that yeah, something Yeah, that's different? Rionet. Majority, I would say that 70% uh, um, uh, of our revenue of those, all those utilities is in the water side. Um, and I think that we would be in the shared savings uh, game, the, the market leaders. Um, when it comes to that. Um, and I think that I, I need to, uh, you know, even though I sponsor, I think that um, it's not always the target market. It's not, it's not something, it's not something, it's not a commodity. It's not like Kaylee's product, Equine 74, that's really related to the shows. Um, Rionet, I think a lot of people that work at Rionet um, are from the Jean Corba, um, yeah, Philippa Baxter, Pierre Part, they're all um, people that I've met through um, in the equestrian industry and they work there and they're a valuable part of, of Rionet. Um, and the sponsorship from Rionet's point of view is mainly because of the influence that um, the horses have had in my life. You know, the passion, the fact that I could, would think it's the single most, uh, it's the single factor that has changed my life from where I started to where I am today has been all due to the horses. So it's, it's my way of giving back to the sport and saying, you know, thank you without, without the sport and these magnificent animals, you know, I wouldn't have had the colorful and, and, and um, exciting life that I have had. So, um, you know, that's why the sponsorship and that's why I like to give back, give back more just to the horses and the sport, more so than to, to promote rear net. Um, mm -hmm to say, if I could put it that way. Well, you mentioned this exciting and colorful life that you have led through the world of horses. We want to hear about it. That's the, the point of these shows, getting to know our top equestrians, our top riders. Um, tell us about your background, Gavin. Let's start all the way at the beginning because your, your mom was very horsey. That's how you got involved, isn't it? Well, I think it actually, actually started with my dad. My mom doesn't come from a horsey family. Uh, my, uh, my family are from uh, a little place called Vondefontein, which is between um, Belfast and Middleburg. 
in Mpumalanga. Um, I went to school in Belfast. Um, our farm was 10 minutes um, away from Belfast, um, cold area. And my grandfather um, <clears throat> had a passion for horses. He bred race horses. He used to bring his horses up to the Vol to race. He was truck and trained them himself. Um, he was also very, very in, uh, uh, part of the Noetgedacht breed. I believe the Noetgedacht Society kicked him out when he wanted to introduce Connemara into to, to get them a little bit more sporty and a bit more user friendly. So he got kicked out of that. But he was and he was crazy about tent pegging. Um, my dad uh, got his Springback colours for Jimkana. And then obviously when my mom uh, met my dad, um, she got she fell in love with the horses. The horses, there were always horses on the farm and there's always stuff to do. Um, whether it was uh, Jim Connor, the tent pegging side, whether we were playing polo cross. Um, um, and that's, uh, that's how we got into the horses. Um, and then uh, my mom was actually, my mom actually broke in two very good horses that jumped in the international classes. Uh, I don't know if you remember a horse called uh, Epal Talisman, the Tony Lewis oh. jumped. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he was by Drabant out of propitiation. My mom actually broke um, him and a, and a half-brother of his uh, um, Emerald King. My mom actually broke them in as three-year-old. So she worked for Jerry de Toy on the farm. Mm -hmm. So she used to drive through and, and, and that's how she got involved with European pedigrees because uh, Jerry de Toy is one of the pioneers in terms mm -hmm. of bringing warm bloods into the country. Um, before that, uh, access to uh, warm blood breeding was via Namibia. But I think Jerry and the Coromandel Stud, which is also the neck of the woods, were, were pioneers in bringing in, um, uh, with David and Charlotte Stubbs, bringing in um, the European breeds and crossing. Are you, are you, talk, are you talking about Coromandel, Sydney Press's? Sydney Press, yeah. stud. Uh, yes, but he brought in, he brought in with. With uh, Charlotte Stubbs, he brought in one of the first, uh, uh, he brought in Drabant, which uh, the, uh, the mayor arrived in fall. So it was side north of the line and fall down here. And Drabant is the, obviously the father of Emerald King and uh, Talisman. And sure. that, that on to propitiation and signification mayors was the background of the Elzu or the foundation of the Elzu, of the Elzu stud. And I still remember, my mom and Jerry giving me a, a, a red, they, what they called them the spermex books, is when they just started freezing semen and we started to go in the old stallions like Gotthard, Domspatz, all of those were in there. And that's, that is where the, the, um, the interest and the fascination for the, for the breeding side of it came in. Mm. And, and then your mom started breeding on her own. And how big did that get and where was she breeding? So she was breeding in Bonnefontein. She had a she had a Drabant mare, um, actually bred bred at Cor by Cor uh, at Coromandel out of one of the mares that um, um, Charlotte Stubbs had brought in, um, and she bred that to Wachmann. Bred a horse. Um, I think her first her first horse that she bred was a horse called Wilberforce, that um, I sold to Steve Shalom. He ended yes. up jumping him in the one fifties um, before he sadly passed away. So. Mm -hmm. That was her first uh, sort of her start of her breeding. And um, she always bred one or two mares. And then she got married to um, a guy in the Eastern Cape called uh, Errol Moorcroft. And he had a farm. And then she, um, she bred more extensively. And uh, that's mm -hmm. when we imported, she imported a stallion called Ubergaba, which you'll, uh, Kirsten Wynn's horse that mm -hmm. she rides in the, in the big classes is uh, Uber Royale. It's by Uber mm. Mm. So, yeah, that's, she's always had, and, and, and she was always, I think it came from a place where she always said to me, my boy, because we, we, obviously we, we, um, we were struggling farmers growing up, so there was really never any money. But the great thing about the horses was is this dream that you could breed a horse to compete that would be able to jump the 150 classes, even as somebody that didn't have money. If you had a mare and you could find the right stallion, who knows, some magic could happen and, you know, uh, you could find a special, you know, you could breed a special horse that could take you, you know, into the limelight. So I think that was always the fascination of, uh, with the breeding from my mom's side because we, 
Um, I very much did my whole junior career on hand-me-downs, on horses that I got from everywhere. Um, but she said, you know, we'll breed one that, that will be good enough then to, to you know, to uh, hold its own. And did you ever throw your leg over one of those that your mom bred that's, uh, that's done pretty well? I think Wilberforce was probably the best. You know, the others have all... <laughs> and you sold it! You know, they, she still bred, she still, uh, my mom bred very much the old fashioned way where you had a whole lot of mares. You had a stallion in the area, which was invariably Jerry de Tour stallion. So they all went to Wachmann. And then from Wachmann, all the Wachmann fillies went to another stallion. And that's generally, we know now um, that, that your chances of success doing it that way is not great. Um, the mother line is the important part. So if you're lucky to have, like in racing, you have a, what they call a blue hen, a mare that keeps producing 150 horses, um, then you have a chance of, of that. And uh, she didn't follow that recipe. So a lot of them were, you know, there were some, I've jumped, uh, I, had a, I had a very good horse called Woody Allen that jumped to 140. Um, Wilberforce was obviously the best, but it was the first one and I was off to university, so I sold him. I broke him in, rode him for two years and then sold him. So I never had a chance to jump him in the bigger classes, but the best was, was a horse called Woody Allen that I jumped in the 140s. Yeah, it was a good horse. So you were, you were born into it. Was your mom already breeding by the time um, when you were in short pants? No, no, it was later. It was in my teens that she started. Yeah. Okay. So take us back to those pony riding years. Did you have much of a career in, in children's? Were you still in the Belfast area? Um, yeah, we were in the Belfast area. We used to come up in a cattle truck. Um, the ponies used to jump on and off. I think we shocked a few of the, of the, of the, the, the Sandon kids. You know, the triggers would arrive. It was a bit of a circus. Um, and uh, it was, uh, those were good times. You know, there was always from the start, there was pressure because it was financially, it was a big, uh, a big sacrifice for my parents to bring us up for a show, my brother and I. Um, I had a very good, uh, my first very good pony was a pony called Piccolo that we got. Uh, she had bad ring bone, but we got her to get a faith healer and my mom would just have all sorts of herbs and things that she had the horse on when, and I had a good career on her. And I, I managed to get into the, um, the first ever children's Transvaal team mm -hmm. with, uh, I think the team was, it was myself on a horse called Dior. Uh, Colin Ferreira on a horse called uh, Zulu Girl, uh, Chantal, um, Chantal Kutsia, her daughter rides, I forget, I forget the daughter, I think her name's Amy, she rides in Natal, she rides the black uh, Escudo gelding, um, what's his name, that they bought yes. from Annie uh, yes. a very good rider, um, and her mom was in the, in the team, and then a girl called Karen Skitter, so there were the four of us, I think that was in... I think it was 85 and we were, yeah, that was the first ever children's team. So that was, jumped the Transvaal Champs, which was always the biggest class then. Um, went into adults on a, on a polo cross horse that my dad had that ended, that we found out that three years well, before. Hang, we hang on, you, you've, skipped, you've skipped juniors. What happened to juniors? No, that's juniors. Oh, there was that juniors, the Transvaal junior juniors. team. Okay. So, yeah, so I rode in the... I rode Elliot in the Vance, it's just popped into my head. Elliot, Elliot Vance. Elliot Vance, that's it, that's it. Amy McCow. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, um, um, so that was, I rode in the CA classes, um, 85, and then we went into the juniors, and I got a, uh, one of my dad's polo cross thoroughbreds, a uh, horse called Paloma Diablo. He was by Noble Chieftain. With a really long front end, but he had a lot of scope. Um, and I got him. <clears throat> obviously, he had done three years of polo cross, so it was uh, it was it was a battle keeping him sound. Um, he had done a lot, um, but he got me into the JAs, and then I got a horse called Alzu Conqueror. Um, also, it was a full brother to Talisman, actually. Um, mm. The run propitiation that Domini jumped in the in the, those days, the A grades, and Jerry Detour gave him to me. I only had one eye. And I had a horse that I got given at SA Champs called Strike that I ended up jumping in the in the JAs. So I had I had horses. They weren't they weren't fantastic, but they 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 kept me they kept me up there jumping the one thirties in in juniors. Mm. And Gav, who were the uh, people on the ground helping you? Was your mom instrumental in your tuition? I mean, 
I started riding. My first instructor was Pat Van Rienen, Um and she uh, she helped me ride through children's in, and into juniors. Um, uh, the worst thing about Pat is that she made us do everything, equitation and dressage, which was really what I hated the most. I wish I'd uh, I'd paid more attention in dressage because now now that I've been overseas and everything, it's the foundation, it's the the cornerstone of show jumping. Um, so, and then I used to come up in the holidays and I worked for Tony Lewis, um, used to go with him to the shows. Obviously, at the time, he was being sponsored by the Alzu Stud. And Jerry Detroit from the Alzu Stud was, a, was a, uh, you know, somebody who was very supportive in my riding career. He used to come and give me a lesson every now and again. And, um, he, was, uh, he was very supportive. I mean, he bought me my first car when I started doing my articles. And um, yeah, he was, uh, I, I, you know, you know, you have those people along the way without, without whom you wouldn't be able to have got over some of the hurdles that there are in life. And, uh, you know, Jerry used to, used to speak to Tony Lewis and say, come, this boy is really keen um, <clears throat> and he would like to learn and work. And um, yeah, I ended up riding at Tony's in the holidays and um, yeah, he, he helped, uh, and uh, yeah, I saw the, saw the really big sport. I spent many days at the old Nando watching him and the other greats ride. And um, so far as horses and a career in horses were concerned, was there ever a point in your life where you thought you wanted to make a career out of horses? Or was it always you realized that money was key and education and a business would be the, 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 the cornerstone of, of, of funding a a career in horses, a, a show jumping career, or, or, I mean, where was your mind at when you finished school? There was talk, there was talk for me to go and do a, a year of, um, um, I think Tony, Tony Lewis uh, had, obviously he had huge contacts and he, he mentioned that he could get me into, um, with uh, Paul Schockermuller in those days to go straight off to school and ride there. But I had a very, I had a, I had a, I had a very strong mother. And uh, mm. she had, um, she was bent, hell bent on the fact that I would have a career as a businessman and she couldn't see a future. And also as a junior, as I said, I was, I wasn't, I wasn't, no, I never had a horse. I wasn't winning. So it was, mm. I was always there and about and I had a, I think, I think in the, in the, in, the, in one of the Grand Prix, I had a second, which was about the best I had in my junior career. I was always third or fourth or fifth. And, I had horses that year to try and jump clear rounds on. So I don't think I was, I never ever saw myself as a, as a, as a crackerjack rider. I think um, I just, it wasn't sort of something and I thought, shoo, I'm good enough to go and take on the world. You know? and, um, mm. and one of the things I didn't want is obviously growing up in a family that was, that was in permanent, uh, in permanent recession we were. Mm. Um, I, I wanted to change that. I didn't want to have that. And the horses would be, I, I always knew that they were would be involved. I'd been uh, they'd be a part of my life. Um, and uh, but as a career, I didn't think that uh, that it was an option. Mm. So tell us about your tertiary education. What you decided to to go into when you say you you did your articles and where you studied. Well, I uh, I wanted to be a vet, um, and I got into I got into honest support. And uh, my mom had a sneaky suspicion that uh, I wouldn't have the stomach for it. Uh, I have a weak stomach. So um, she sent me with, I remember the vet, at the, uh, the Elzu Stud vet, uh, uh, Dr. Harki Fanikak at the time. During that October break we used to have for 10 days. And he, she said, go, go with, with Harki and see what this job's all about. Mm. And um, I remember we got to, to a farmer and there was a, a cow with a big abscess and he launched the this big abscess and that was the end of veterinary science for me. I got home and it was it. I just couldn't see myself doing any of that. Um, so then it was a little bit late because uh, I'd missed applications to, to all the universities like WITS, et cetera. And again, Jerry Detour stepped in and he said, look, my auditor, um, Berger and Biermann in Middleburg, I can go and talk to Mr. Biermann and uh, you, you got no option now. You've missed out on all the other universities. They've closed. Now we're talking October, November. It's, it's too late. So he said, uh, I'll get your car. Um, um, he kept, uh, I, I went to his place to ride one or two horses in the mornings. 
um, breaking in and all of that. That lasted for about six months. But anyway, I started my article, started with UNISA, worked in the day, studied in the evening and rode really early in the morning before work. And that's how it started for me. Um, after a year at Bergen and Biermann, they sent me up to an, uh, um, I came up for an audit conference for all the um, article clerks. And I realized that the people there were doing things that I hadn't seen in the small um, um, environment. And again, the horses helped through uh, Rob McConaughey and a guy called Colin Smith. I managed to get into an uh, audit firm in Randburg, moved my articles, uh, finished my degree at UNISA, did my honors, did my CTA, wrote the board exam. Um, yeah, and qualified as a CA and started working. Mm. So the whole time while you were studying, horses were still there. You never took a break from horses. You continued riding, continued competing, juggling the two. Yes, I rode until I was, until I hit uh, the CTA year, which is your year that you have to do before you write the board exam. And then there was really no time. You know, I needed to focus on this, on this mountain that was lying ahead. And I rode, I kept horses with Tony Lewis. I used to go and ride in the mornings. Um, he gave me a horse called Lord of the Rings, um, which Barry had been, I think Barry had ridden, Roger Essen had ridden, Johnny Mendes had ridden, everybody had sort of, and he managed to get me, I remember he bought him for, I think 5,000 Rand at the Derby, the, at the Derby when I was 17, when I was still in matric, and he gave him to me after that and said, he has a horse that you can fiddle with and play with him on the farm and we see, and the following year I rode in my, in my first year, um, uh, studying, I rode at the Derby, and I think uh, I think I rode the first two qualifiers for the big Derby, and then he walked out lame after the second qualifier, and I never got to go in the big Derby then. And then after that, it was mostly young horses and a ride. The Tony would give me a um, a thoroughbred to go and jump at a show. We'd be going to go to Fortrek a week on the weekend. He said, "Yeah, here's a horse for you to ride." And it was that sort of thing. I had <clears throat> I had this uh, warm blood that my mother had bred that I spoke about Wilberforce. Mm. that I was sort of bringing up. But when I was 21, I sold him. And I had to get out and focus on, um, on, 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 on my university career. Mm. So at what stage then did you decide to get serious about it again and, and really throw yourself back into the sport? So I, I went off and uh, I, I qualified and then I, I, I um, started in the corporate world, started with a startup with the... the in the cellular industry when MTN started. I was there for a while. The, the vehicle tracking industry with Tracker, I was there, I was financial manager there. Then I got headhunted by, by a listed company. I went to Privest, they were labor brokers, uh, listed labor broking business, was there for a while. And then it was while I was at Privest when I could see I needed some balance. It was just been work, work, work. Mm -hmm. I got married, I got married really uh, uh, young and I had, um, I think uh, I was 20, uh, 27 when Kaylee arrived. Uh, I got married at 24, 27 when Kaylee arrived. And it's it, from basically 21 to 27, it was just work, flat out, trying to, trying to make ends meet um, <clears throat> and get ahead. And then while I was at Privest, um, you know, with some of the benefits are there, I could afford to get a horse again and get back into it. And by the time I was 30, I, I, I went overseas and bought, you know, bought, bought, bought some horses again and decided, right, I, I'm, I'm enjoying this, you know, um, mm. with, you know, I, I never, never looked at it to say with, it was just something that I was always, I never, I used to go and watch the Derby every year. I used to go and watch uh, whenever there was a, a weekend or a Sunday that I was, I used to go and watch and see what was happening and still remembering. The more I stayed away, the more impossible it looked to ever jump 150 again. I think that's what a lot of people have to, it's the difficult part of the sport. When you, when you get out of those bigger grades to get back in, it's a, it's a mindset. You know, when you're doing it week in, week out, you don't even notice if the jumps are that big. And I still remember in those years going to watch and thinking, how, how do you manage to get back in here? How do you mm -hmm. jump? How do these people manage to jump these jumps? And, um, and slowly but surely, I got back into the into it until I got uh, and it was basically financial I, I could afford it again so mm -hmm. you know well I could afford it for the first time in my life without assistance from Jerry Detour, Tony Lewis or my mom you know so yeah, yeah. 
And on that buying trip, when you were 30, some of the horses you brought back, and were they were those the horses that, that put you back in the big time, that got you up the grades? So I went, um, my, first, um, my first trip overseas, I decided to go to the Holstein, because at the time I was reading all the Holsteiners were dominating. And I, I, I'm gonna, I, I don't know what date it is, let me think. Uh, it, I think we're talking about 2005, around there, 2004, 2005. I went to the Holsteiner auction uh, that they have in the first week of November. Um, and they have an elite auction there and I wanted to buy myself a really good four or five year old. And that's where I met uh, um, Ian Callender Easby. We actually sat next to each other at the auction or we had dinner. And I was a South African, he was there, and he, he had also just started getting into the, into the breeding game. Um, so he was buying. Unfortunately, the mayor I wanted, I had a budget of 30,000 euros. She went for 95. I didn't have, I, didn't, I was naive. I didn't, I didn't think of a second horse or anything like that. She went for 95,000 uh, euros, so <clears throat> I was stuck in, um, uh, in Germany. And Ian, Ian recommended that I go straight from the auction to Hanover to a guy called Gunter Friemel, who was in charge of marketing at the Hanoverian Society. And I arrived there, and he put me in touch with Hilma Meyer, and that's how I met Hilma. And I went straight to Hilma's place, spent three days there, and bought a horse, a mare called Little Crisby by a stallion called Lord Kim, um, out of a Capitol mayor, um, who was um, basically the only horse I saw there that looked like a thoroughbred. You know, the others were really big, strong, uh, foreign looking. I was still very much growing up on thoroughbreds. It's always been, you know, looking at a fine horse, not, a, not the heavy horse. So I bought her, very careful mare. Um, didn't have the scope in the end. I jumped it to 135 and then sold her on. Uh, went back, bought, well, I, I, I think while I had her, I went and bought a mare called the Dell. That was my second purchase. She ended up being a very nice 135, 140 speed or so, and a lot of classes on her. And it was just a nice horse to have at the show. You'd always know that there was a class, she, there's a class that you can win on her. Uh, but my first real horse I bought was a mare called Electra. I'm sure you, you can remember her, big black mare. Scudo Graf Granos, Eisenbart Domspatz Goddard. And she, at the time I was training with Domini, and she changed my life. I think uh, that's the first proper horse I sat on in my life. Um, and from there... Well, think, well, before you move on, tell us a bit about her, some of those big wins, going up the grades, getting back into the 150s and how it felt. Yeah, we started in the 130s. I was two down. I remember the first, I, I was convinced. I mean, I jumped houses on her when I tried her. And I, I was convinced that uh, I was unstoppable on this horse. I'd never sat on anything that was quite, uh, she was a big man. And, uh, she was, I mean, she didn't look big with me on, but she was, she was a good 17 hands. Um, a blood mare for a big mare and, and super clever in the first, and you could just, and uh, so competitive, wanted to win. You could feel from when you, when I tried her, I think I jumped five jumps and uh, bought her. Um, and just, I just hadn't felt anything like that. Brought her back here and we had eight faults in our first show. You know, had great expectations. And that's where I also mm -hmm. learned it takes, it takes a year for these horses to get back to where they were with the quarantine and everything. And um, she, um, yeah, so we, with Domini, we went through the grades. And my first 150 show was SA Champs 2008. So I had, a, I had three, I think three 140 shows on her, three, one, three 140 shows on her. And Domini, I said to Domini, Domini said, why don't you try the 150s at SA Champs? And I mean, normally you don't do that. And yeah. I went and uh, she won the first qualifier. Second class she jumped uh, was the uh, Natal Outdoor Grand Prix which is the second qualifier normally at SA Champs, because still at the Cyril Gagan Stadium. She was second to Sean Neal um, on his, he had, a, he had a gray stallion by Capital, I forget what his name is, Bulana van Lobos, mm -hmm. I was second to him. And uh, in the final SA Champs, in SA Champs, she was highest qualifier. Um, she jumped double clear. It was myself, Lisa, and Sean Neal on Gold Rush, 
Um, Lisa was an Orango P. And uh, I missed the inside turn to the wall, which still haunts me. She still jumped clear. But she jumped, she had jumped at her first 150 show, she had jumped six rounds clear, mm. which was amazing. And that was the start of, of everything. It was my first 150 show. And from then, I've, I've been lucky enough to manage to keep myself in the 150s on various mm. other horses through time. So that was the breakthrough for me. And some of her big wins because there were World Cups and yeah, campaigning she, and all she, the big clubs. She won, she, won she won the big emerald at Carcliffe, the 180,000 rand emerald at Carcliffe. That was where they combined. So that, that was sort of the World Cup. Uh, and she won, she won the Natal Grand Prix. She won the Gauteng Grand Prix. She won the Grand Prix at Polokwane. Um, she was third in SA Champs uh, three times, I think. Um, she, uh, and just in between, just would have a win in her at every show. There would be a 150 class that she was either first or second. Um, and she did this for a long period of time. I mean, she did, she jumped, I jumped her till uh, she was 15 in the big stuff, 15, 16. And then uh, Kaylee had two good years out of her. Um, jumping in the 135, she won the SA, she, she won the 135 uh, cha champs at, um, I remember at, uh, at the Easter show with Kaylee, and Kaylee was just into, into juniors. Mm. So, yeah, just a, just a fantastic horse. And with your love of breeding, were there embryos? Have you bred with her? Have you got progeny? So I've been, I've been a little bit, um, um, I haven't done too many embryos because I don't believe in fiddling with the mares while they're competing. So, um, Ian, uh, Ian took three embryos from her the first season. And then last, uh, last season, she carried her first foal. Um, and unfortunately, early in the year, she died of pneumonia. So, Electra's no more. But we've got four offspring on the ground and luckily one filly amongst those. So her mother line will carry on going. So let's mm. hope we'll see what it is. Mm. Uh, but <clears throat> as I say, I think if you go back in every horse, every rider that has sort of ridden and done reasonably well, you'll find a great horse. You can't do it without a great horse. And I think that's the, the bottom line of our sport nowadays. It's horsepower. Mm. It's Formula mm. One racing. The guy with the best car wins. Yeah. So you you've had some wonderful horses um since her and and mostly mares govett have you got an affinity with mares you prefer them they say if you if you find a good mare there's nothing there's nothing to beat them but um they also can be quirky yes um i think that mine initially was a little bit of thinking like an accountant um what residual value do i have after i've competed this horse what if it does it blows a tendon along the way if you've got a really, really good mare, you can still some, have something uh, from her. I think geldings, once they've used, once they're done in the sport, have a particularly difficult life. You know, they're so used to, you know, that uh, you can feel the good horses enjoy the competition. They come into the ring, they feel the atmosphere, they like competing, um, they like winning, and then. It's always sad that the, 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 the geldings almost retire and they they've served their purpose in life. You know, they don't. Mm. Whereas with the mares, they still, they still get looked after. They still get loved because they're producing champions for you. Um, and I think that is, uh, I, that was my thinking always. Is I, um, it was my insurance policy. Um, I yeah. don't insure my horses, but it was my insurance policy. If I've got a mare and she breaks down, I've dabbled in some, some, uh, some uh, geldings of late. Um, but mostly, I still look for a good mare because uh, I enjoy the breeding, and I know that when she's done, she'll be looked after and loved because she's got she's got this she's jumped herself and she's invariably got a good pedigree. Was the next good one C Ultra or was Louisa first? So, um, uh, so the next I then bought a mare. I qualified. They then had these qualifiers for I don't know which one. I think it was Kentucky. Was it Kentucky? Yeah, for the World Games and <clears throat> Electra, um, they did some qualifiers here, yeah, and she qualified, of course. But Electra was was if you in the big World Cups when it got really big, she used to struggle a little bit. So she was an unbelievable mare, but she didn't have any scope. 
So I went and bought a mare called Strachatilla that had Enscope, but was very difficult. Um, and obviously with the South Africa, that's always the problem. When you buy a ready-made horse here with our currency, and once they've seen, you know, if it's already 12 or 13 years old with some experience. So I jumped her a little bit. I jumped around the derby, jumped some big classes on her, but uh, she just, she, um, she was, she'd been at Bear Bombs. Um, she'd been all over to a big yard. She had a massive jump, but she was temperament wise, she was difficult. So I jumped her in the big stuff. Um, I then went through a patch where, well, uh, we bought Louisa, uh, not for myself, and uh, I tried to sell Louisa here as she arrived because it didn't work out. Um, and then she just stood there, and eventually I said, Look, this horse can't stand in the stable. Uh, and I started in the 120s at Cockcliffe, where, where, um, where Electra won the Big Emerald. Um, and I started in the 120s. And the following year, she jumped, she jumped the big derby with me. And in 2012, straight after the derby, we went into the um, SA uh, Riders Champs, where they swap, where you swap horses. Mm -hmm. And uh, we jumped, I jumped clear on all four horses and won a motor car. So that was, I suppose, my next uh, good horse. And then after that, um, well, I bought before you, before you carry on, it's interesting to say when you say it didn't work out. What do you mean when it? It didn't work out that she stood in the stable. Just the the relationship at first, you guys didn't gel, or were there were there problems with the mayor? Or the mayor was very hot, and she was, uh, and it, uh, it uh, the horses bought for Tracy, very hot. Um, mm. And then I had uh, and I had a few people come and try her, but she was she was a real blood mare, very hot, had a beautiful mouth, but used to just leap at the fences, run at them, and wanted to run and jump and in a hurry and want to get out the way. And I just played with her. And <clears throat> I think the mayor, and you saw with what she did with Kaylee afterwards, mm. um, the mayor was incredibly brave um, to a point that I think, um, and it was such a specialized ride that I think Kaylee on some of the other horses still battles with what she had to, what she learned to do on Louisa. I think Louisa, you had to, canter down to a big fence and not uh, sit really quietly, give her space and do nothing. You know, mm. if you gave her a, a fraction of leg, she would jump through the front rail. And I think actually um, Anne-Marie, it was the only mistake Anne-Marie made in the four of us, uh, in the four that we rode in that final was exactly that. It was the, the last ox I remember. It was a little bit bigger. And we had a great distance and she just, just supported her with her leg a little bit. She jumped straight through the front rail. So it was a strange, it was a horse that you had to <clears throat> learn how to ride. Um, and Kaylee grew up on her. And now we, you know, when Barry helps Kaylee, the biggest thing sometimes is that she gives them space and she sits quietly. And some of the other horses mm -hmm. that she rides now needs a bit of support. But she's, you know, she's obviously, luckily she's young enough and she's getting there. But uh, that, was her, that was her difficulty. If you, if you thought... I'm gonna go forward, she was gone. Um, mm. She would just run and jump. Stupid brave, dangerously brave, would do anything, mm. you know. Um, so, but what a great horse she ended up being. And I mean, I ended up, I think I paid for her, I think I paid 20,000 euros for her. So. Which, and she ended up being a, a, a horse that, that won, a, won a motor car and um, took my daughter into World Cups and showed her all the big tracks, um, yeah. Um, mm. So that was a real, a real luck along the way to have found her. So she sort of, she took over for a period. Had, had she, had, how much had she done before you got her? Because you say a year from 120s to the big 150 classes, that's some serious going. Yeah, she was, uh, she jumped, uh, I think she jumped 130, 135s over yeah. there. Um, but if you, if you knew her, you'd understand that she had, unbelievable scope and 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 she was she was almost better when you jump bigger fences on her because if it was small she'd be running at them have no respect yeah. for them one of those horses you know so i think it is quick it is fast but not for that type of horse a, a mare like that it wouldn't be a problem if it, uh, some of the other horses that had more quality if i'd done that to ultra it would have been it would have been game set and match you know Mm. Ultra was completely different. Ultra had to stay in a grade for a long time before you could take it to the next one. So that was well, different. Let's, 
let, let's move on to ultra because as you say completely different kind of a horse um yeah. how much readjustment did you have to do in in your ride and getting off louise and then going on to see ultra who was a a massive mare very powerful very strong as well yeah so ultra uh, ultra is by Kazal, uh, uh, old fashioned um, uh, Hellsteiner breeding, Kazal, Cartago, Calypso, Landgraf. So, I mean, I could imagine, and she's from Kazal's first crop. Now, mm. Kazal, when he started breeding, was one of the smaller Hellsteiner stallions around. So, you can imagine what uh, I haven't met her, and I would have liked to have seen her, but you could imagine what a, what a, what a beast. Um, Ultra's mother must have been. Yeah. So I think what was going on in the breeder's head was like, because I was one of the smallest horses that were licensed this year, 166. Was, was, he, a, was he a small horse? He doesn't look. Yeah, he very small, like. 16 1. He was 16 1. Remember, Rolf Goran Banks, a small guy. Yeah, he must, be a, he must be a midget because he didn't look like a small horse going around those tracks. He looked like quite <laughs> a big horse to me. <laughs> I had a sure. big step, but he wasn't tall. He was a small yeah. horse. Um, and so. So Ultra's Katago mother must have been a monster. So mm. I think that was the breeding, the breeders thinking, and it's a it's a good cross Kazal Katago. Um, but the Kazals, just like him, they very soon. And he, I can't tell you um, as a mare. I lost I lost eighteen months with her because she had two colic ops. Um, till today, still to the, today she is on. Um, she doesn't eat teff. She doesn't eat. She's on oat hay and uh, mm. and lucerne. If you put her on teff or error and all that, she just starts colicking. So she's a bit funny that way. So that took me time to figure out. The reason why I got Kaylee's product is because I needed something to maintain her overseas um, because she's got a you know she gets a, a meprocoat when she jumps to stop the acid completely mm. uh, during the competition. Um, otherwise, you have problems. Um, and then I found this, sub, uh, this equine 74, which I could maintain her on, and she thrived on it. And then I thought, well, this is an unbelievable product. Mm. Um, I might as well, um, it's something for Kaylee to dabble in and learn about business, you know, a bit about mm -hmm. importing, and it is a nice learning curve for her in, in bringing that in. But Ultra, Ultra's biggest problem is her body. She's built like a banana, upside down, mm. very weak behind the saddle, ox out the back door. Um, extremely careful. I think Ray Corba actually went to try her. Um, I actually didn't even sit on her. I saw him try her out, loved her jump. Um, she was big, which I wanted because I'm tall. Um, and he didn't buy her because he bought, at the time he bought with Barry's old horse, Counter Attack was the horse that he chose and, on that trip. Um, and I asked him if I could, I could buy the mare and I ended up buying her. And when I saw her the first time, I thought, oh, She's a lot bigger than what I thought she was. Mm. And, how how um, big is she? 18 hands. Sure. No, he's a big mm. horse. Um, and and what, what had she done up until that stage? Was she at, at Hilmar? Is that where, you, where, where Ray tried to... Uh, Hilmar had just seen her at a show and he had brought her to, the, to his yard. He had collected her, some horses for, for Ray to try. Um, interesting enough, the third horse that he tried was a mare called Lucifer that I, I got towards the end of her career that I tried to jump around the derby. Um, but so those are the three that he tried. Um, all of them ended up being 150 horses, so it was quite a good batch. Um, she had done 130s, um, she's a six year old. Um, and uh, yo, her biggest thing is to get her body round, you know, mm. and then she's got extreme blood. Um, I think a lot from the Katago side, and then the, the, the extreme care, Kazal, you know. the she she's allergic to timber for a big horse like that um very few of I, that i've ridden have been that careful um and that that ended up being a little bit her problem because um her being that careful she she likes to run so she's almost uncontrollable in, at times and then suddenly drops the bit if it gets really big and then you have to come with a lot of leg because she's backing off the front rail and then the back rail becomes an issue if you get her on the day that she's nice and relaxed and she feels confident, um, then she's a very good horse and she can jump a lot of clear rounds. Look, she's won a President's Cup. She won a World Cup. So, you know, she's been placed second and third in many Grand Prix. She wasn't always, because she's so big and not that rideable, she wasn't that easy to, 
to navigate around the jump offs because when she when you set sail you must understand that you're not getting her back during the track she's just going to run with you um um so for me probably the the most difficult horse i've ridden in in and especially around big big uh, big courses but i found a way with her and i was uh before i took her overseas i was confident uh, you know i jumped a lot of big tracks clear yeah a lot of uh, mm. a lot of uh, i mean the, she was third in that one world cup qualifier at shong where a lot of horses didn't see the finish because it was that big um mm. and she jumped that for fun and uh, double clear and she was third so yeah, it, uh, she was, and, and she'd qualified, obviously, for the World Equestrian Games, and it was something, I, I was already complaining, uh, I was already had some horses overseas, and I was riding there, so I thought, what, let's take her along and see what happened. Well, what did happen? Take us through that, that trip and, and the whole quarantine process, because bringing them in, you say the mares, the mares take a long time to, to adjust, but I'd imagine going out, the mares, they have their cycles, you go into different he hemispheres, different weather patterns, did it take a big toll on her? I never got her back to what she was yet, yeah, to be honest. Um, and the problem was I was already there. So I'd, 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 uh, I'd bought uh, Volker over there. I had a young horse, uh, Krabat, that you've seen, that I also bought over there. And I had a horse called Fortune Forever that Azing's riding now. So those are my mm -hmm. three horses that were based, that I had there. And I'd, I had, <clears throat> so I was riding there, flying back, doing the World Cups here going back so I had sort of two strings going um i had uh, um I'd, i was fortunate to find a really good ceo for my business and uh, rianek was flying so i could hand over the reins and somebody and i could i could spend two or three hours every day uh, looking after the business and um uh yeah, I started competing there, and then um, when she had that good season and qualified, I said, "Well, why not let her join the join the join the, the group of horses that I had there?" The difficulty for uh, she never got she never recovered from that. She was a horse that, and what I realise now is why she did well in the World Cups here is that we we can go and jump one thirty five, we can jump. Two classes, 135, and only recently did they introduce the FEI class where you have to ride the one FEI class before you can ride the World Cup qualifier. Back then, you could just ride and go into the World Cup if you decided to mm -hmm. on the Sunday. And that was for her. Um, I used to always just keep her confident and then and then go in the World Cup and have a, and have one good class in her. The difference in Europe is. Uh, you have to from day one. You have to jump big jumps, and you know she didn't have the luxury of running up. I, I had one good show with her in Samorin, a four star where she jumped the bigger, bigger class. And when I say good show, she went round the Grand Prix with three and four down, which I think was good because it was four star and it was jumps that I haven't, I haven't the likes I hadn't seen before. Mm. Um, but I had Volker to qualify. So I fiddled with her in the, in the 135, 140s. I would put Volker in the 150, first qualify, qualify for the Grand Prix. Um, and then, uh, then I, I had two shots at it with her. So, um, but the f two weeks later, I took it to a three star in Belgium and the mayor's tank was empty. She was done. She'd given me everything at Samarin. Um, mm -hmm. she jumped halfway through the first qualifier, um, um, with a st uh, difficult track. And the first time she had to work out of a treble, I could feel her. She wasn't happy. She never ever stopped, but she just started. You know, she just pushed her all out the way, which was mm -hmm. not like, she basically just, that was her way of giving up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was, and I had bad luck, because Fortune Forever was my backup horse for the big stuff. Um, he had, he had I, I took him to Hamburg, uh, to the Hamburg Derby. Then I got him back out. Then he went lame. Um, he had did a ligament in his foot. And uh, so he was out um, while Ultra was in quarantine, because it was, for me, it wasn't a, I really wanted to go to the games, and with Fortune, I could have. Um, I suppose I could have given it a bash on Volker, but you don't want to. Um, mm. It's not her cup of tea. That it's you know she's a brilliant winning 150 horse. She ain't a mm. 155, 160 winning horse. So mm. um, yeah, it, it it just didn't work with her, and we didn't have enough time because we set up a Nations Cup. I think the horses came out in January or February. February, they came out of quarantine, and the first Nations Cup was in May. 
in uh, in Drummond. And I really pushed because if we wanted to go to the World Games, I said to everybody, let's get it together. It's Kelly came and found a horse. You know, we were going to try and put a team because going to the World Games at this point, just trying to go as an individual, the best we could possibly do is try and get a spot at the Olympics by beating some of the people in our group as a team. Mm. And um, I said, well, we better get used to doing some team stuff. And I really pushed hard to get a team together for Drummond and Ugalna. Um, but after that, after two Nations Cups, we didn't have, we are, Oliver's horse broke at the second one. Um, and uh, Kelly's horse wasn't right after the first one. So we ran out of horses, actually, to, to keep doing the Nations Cups, mm. which was sad because that was, that was a wonderful experience. Probably on my time winning, winning a, uh, ranking classes and having the success I had with, with, with Volker, um, was insignificant compared to the feeling of riding in a Nations Cup. It was the mm. highlight, I think, of my riding career. Those, those two shows were the highlight of my life, riding. You obviously gained a huge amount of experience and knowledge. What are some of the, the, the key differences between there and here that stood out to you and, and, and some of the knowledge that you brought back that you might have implemented into your riding uh, over here? I think... Um, I think on average, um, I'd like to say that we have very good coaches here. And I think we have got a very good system from a, from a riding point of view in terms of, if you look at uh, Barry, Domini, Gonda, um, those coaches, and we've got some good up and coming coaches with Ronnie Healy. And so I think that we've got, and, and we, we ride, I think we ride well enough. Um, so from a riding point of view, the adjustment wasn't massive. I think uh, mentally, um, uh, so from a technical riding point of view, I think that we're well equipped and we're well coached and we, and we can do it. I think the difficulty is, is to get your head around the fact um, that you're walking into those bigger arenas with bigger jumps. Um, that you, you have to, I wouldn't do, I think it would be difficult if I hadn't ridden as many big classes here and I hadn't been riding uh, 150 classes for a long time in South Africa because the pressure is it is quite hectic and it is a bit foreign and they are not friendly. They're there for themselves. You know, it's not like, yeah, you, you, you know, everybody in the warm up arena, you know, which guys mm. you can ask to give you, you know, put the vertical up two holes or the people all sort of help, you know, we, but when you're there, you're on your own, you know, um, um, I had, um, I had to call in Aza's help once at, at Spain to, so that I could get to the jump because they were bullying my groom off the jump, you know, so mm. I had to I had to call in Aisling and say please just sort these people out here because I need to go, I need to jump you know and uh, so those are so so technically I think we're good enough I think mentally it will take but that also you get used to it our biggest problem is horsepower and it's the same thing wherever you go it's horsepower the game the people are riding horses that are super I mean Lisa's story is is a, is a dream story you know to mm. buy a horse overseas. That is affordable with our Rand Exchange. Come here, take it through the grades, and then it is able to go to the World Games. Um, that's one in a million story. You know, maybe with Kello and Capital breeding and young horses and the quality of the stock going, we will get there. But the obvious thing is that the horsepower is in a different league to, to mm. what we have here. Um, yeah. And then the time. Um, we still ride very slowly here. Um, if I think, uh, if I think how that was a big thing for me, the pressure, the clock pressure is something that I haven't felt yet. You know, you don't, you know, I, you know, I, I don't worry about a time penalty yet. But mm. there constantly, if you weren't, and even on a fast horse like Volker, if you weren't going inside, if you weren't thinking about this, the clock was going to catch you. Um, yeah. The equipment's different, equipment's much lighter. And then, then they have course builders. From the various uh, uh, a larger variety of course builders, we have a few international course builders. Yes, yeah. so you have Kate's, you have uh, um, Kevin Spratley from, you have Anna Building. So you almost have a good idea of what you're going to get. Whereas there, the guy could be coming in from Venezuela. You never, you know, this. Uh, mm. So various different ways of building. Um, that was also a little bit different. To um. To remedy that, uh, that problem with the time that we are too slow, where does that start? Would you be one that encourages course designers here 
not to be too lenient, not to be too nice, not to care about what the riders might say because the times seem too tight. Where does that start? Does it start in the lower stuff or does it start once you hit the 130s, the open grades, that you need to kick on, that you need to, to push, find your rhythm and trust that rhythm and, and, and ride on? Because the reason I say that a lot of time when international course designers do come out, there's in, invariably a few moans and groans that the times are too tight, that the way they measure might be too tight. Um, but that's what we've got to do. That's how we've got to raise our game, is it not? I think that is one of the things that we can, we can do. I think we can be stricter on the time. Look, we, we've got a long way to go. Our, our, our World Cups... But it's not insurmountable, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not negative because I had success there. Um, I, won world, I won a world ranking class there, I, you know. So I don't believe that we need to, it's all doom and gloom about riding overseas. I think it's doable. It's something that I would want to do again, and it's something that, um, that I will hopefully do um, in the next five years is have another bash at it. Um, take what I learned and, 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 and go back um, hopefully with the ability to buy better horses than what I had there. Uh, well, when I say better, better for what I want to do. So I had success up to three-star level. There's four and five-star level, which is a completely different ball game. Um, and the horses, the, the percentage of horses that jump in that division is um, they few and far between. So with what we've got, we, we have to look at what we've got in South Africa. It's pointless we try and start by, by, uh, jumping four and five-star here when we're going to have two or three horses in the class. I think there needs to be a gradual, it has to be very gradual, very planned, very methodical, so that we still have a competition at the end of the day. We, we want to compete. Um, um, and I, So I have in my string, I have a horse like Volker, where I'm very comfortable if they leave it like it is now, because I can gallop flat out uh, in every big class that there is here in South Africa, and she'll be competitive and whatever. But I have a horse, that I think is better that can go and jump four or five star in Krabat. So for him, I would want him to be tested here a little bit, bit more. But like, I would think that it's pointless testing him here and we still don't have a competition. We still want to ride. We still, everybody still wants to see a jump off. But thing like time doesn't hurt a horse. You know, you can't scare a horse if you make the time tighter. It is probably the one area that we could get on a par with Europe without without hurting our horses, without, without scaring them, or without ending up with only four or five people in the class that can jump the mm. jumps. So mm. I think that's, um, that, that would be one way, one, one of the areas it's, it's quite safe to try and get us on a par with, with, with Europe. Mm. You mentioned you, you had a crack in the Hamburg Derby as well. Was, was that one of the highlights? Did you enjoy the class? It, it's... Um, you, you it know. was terrifying, and ter the, 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 the sh it was terrifying. The show itself, um, <laughs> I, I, I remember. I mean, if you go and clip my horse, you'll see I just the, the, the oxer with the with the big with the big poles. Um, I missed completely with Fortune into that. I mean, I asked him to take off. I mean, uh, I don't know what, to, but it's it's it's, it's uh, 30, thirty odd thousand people knowing they're jumping. Um, it was a terrifying experience. Um, and what I didn't think, I thought, okay, well, it can't be that bad. I only have to go in a few times in Hamburg. But what I didn't factor in was the training that happens mm. before. And that was particularly terrifying because it is, uh, you know, the bank is steep. But it's a tough course. And I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't ready for it. I, 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 needed, I needed to have spent another year on the horse because I think I'd done two or three 140 classes and one 145 Grand Prix on, on Fortune before we asked him to go and jump that. But uh, mm. he's a trooper. He took out the oxer with his head, not even with his legs. It took them a five-minute break with Clip, Clip My Horse to put it back together. He shook the gum pole off his head and carried on down, down to the wall and jumped the wall and finished. You know what I'm saying? He's, a, he's an amazing mm. horse that way. So, But I was... I was, I was but, in saying that, it's a little bit what I've done my whole life is you've got to take yourself out of your comfort zone. You've got to push yourself. You don't know where, um, and it's a little bit, if I didn't take the risks I did take with, with Rionet and in business and in life and in whatever, you, don't, you just don't go forward as a, as a person if you don't challenge yourself and you, and you don't keep setting almost unrealistic goals. 
you know, you just won't yeah. get there. Yeah. So in, in one way, I was sorry that it, uh, I thought I made a bit of an idiot out of myself. It didn't, it didn't go down that well. But on the other hand, it was, I learned from it. And um, I realized that it's, uh, you know, I now I know what it feels like to go in, into a ring with 35,000 people watching mm. Uh, mm. And, and in the game. So there's no, there's no bad, bad experiences. Speaking of derbies, um, where's your mind at when it comes to derbies? They, um, it's a great crowd pleaser. It's, it's a fun event. Most people want to win the derby, but in terms of where show jumping is today, it's not show jumping at its purest. In other words, show jumping today is the, the you know, riding against the course designer and the technicality of it and, and the, the fences that he's, that he's pitching, the rideability of your horse. Um, Derby is something. Well, well, tell us about your history in the Derby, and is it something that you really yearn to win, or are you more um, the purest? Ah, uh, um, my best result in the Derby was with Electra. Uh, I think I had two down or two down, and I was sixth or seventh or sixth, sixth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, other than that, I just I've had I've always had more than more than eight, twelve you know, 16, it's, it hasn't been, but also I don't think I've had the, the right sort of horse for that. Um, mm. And it's again, horses for courses. I think that um, the Derby, it's an interesting question. Obviously I'd love to win the Derby. And I do believe that from a crowd point of view, it is, it's, a, it's a great spectacle. What has happened just naturally, and it's not by, it's not by design, is that we, show jumping used to be mostly um, Derby type, even the normal tracks used to be one jump here, one jump there, like the derby. And, not, and if, we, if we look, even 10 years ago, you were getting a jump every eight seconds in the Grand Prix. Now you're getting a jump every three seconds in the Grand Prix. You know, everything has gone, they've, the horses have got better, the breeding has gone forward, they've got them more careful, more of this. So setting a horse up for a single fence and all of that is not... Um, is not you don't find them Milton Milton did the derby and jumped Olympic Games and did the, mm. overseas the guys don't jump their first string horses in a in a derby anymore. I mean, uh, Et was the last horse that I know that was a complete great that did both. With Hugo Simon was the last mm. great horse that did everything. But the, the, I, I just think that uh, it's now horses for courses again. I, obviously, mm. if I have a great horse that I think I could that is ideal for the derby. Um, I'd love to have a crack at it and I'd love to win it and I admire the guys that have won it. It's a great, it's a great competition to win. It's the one to win here in South Africa. Um, mm. And I think you still have a chance here, but I, I, I don't, I think I might have a horse in Cadiz that I would, I would have another bash at if they have the, um, you know, I'd, I'd have, a, have a crack at the derby with that. But to just jump the derby, I, I've done it a few times. I don't want to go in there if I, if I don't think I've got a realistic chance of of, um, yeah. of having a good place or a win. Yeah. Getting back to see Ultra, you brought her back. Um, is uh, Tell us about the end of her career um, and then moving on to the, the string that you brought back as well, as well Volka, and you've had huge success on her, some World Cup wins and mm -hmm. really a, a tremendous little name. So, um, yeah, I brought, I brought all of them back. Um, uh, just before the World Games, um, I put them all, um, and I brought back. I brought back. Obviously, my front running horse there was Volker, which I had a lot. I mean, she's. Uh, I mean, even there, she had huge success. You know, she, she's won. I would think. I haven't checked when I, but I think would she would have won close to a hundred thousand euros in prize money, um, sure. and uh, fast, careful, uh, doesn't have end scope, um, will jump. Um, and you know, we, that's, it's not the, we, we have some 160 fences and if you go and look, they categorize our World Cup <coughs> qualifiers as a 160 track on uh, uh, Horse Telex or Ramondo or where you go and look, because it is, there are, they're compulsory, there has to be two 160 fences, but they're verticals and then, you know, those are, those are manageable when you get proper big oxes that she, she will start struggling. Um, but what a horse. Um, I think in her division, one of the best in the world. And I, um, she's an out-and-out winner. She knows when it's big day. She's, uh, 
she jumps, if you jump over a meter or meter 10, you wouldn't give me 5,000 euros for her. But she changes, she's a whole new animal when she, um, when it gets big and it's on the final day. Um, Ultra we brought back, um, I gave, um, uh, AZ had a, uh, a ride on her for a bit. Um, she then had an injury. Um, and then is what to do with her now, because I've got, I've got, uh, Cadiz van der Pitsenberg, that is also a 150 horse and young. Um, she's only nine uh, or ten this year. Um, I've got Krabat, who's already at eight, jumped 150, who won international seven-year-olds overseas, who I bought as a young horse. I bought him as a five-year-old and built him up, and he's turned out to be a crackerjack. He, unfortunately, um, he's had an injury, and he'll, he's, he's coming back into work now. So there's... There's already three 150 horses. Um, I've got uh, Larison um, from the Callaho stud, which I believe uh, has got everything to even be a horse that can go overseas because he's got enormous scope and, and a lot of quality. A big step. I'm just working on getting him back in his related distances because he's got such a huge jump and step. That, that that's, and as soon as I can get that right, I'll push him through the grades. And I'm hoping to have him in the 150s next year. So where do I, where do I, what do I do with old Ultra? You know, I also, so I gave it to ASG, I then had the injury, and I've had Carolyn Dupre um, come and work for me and run the yard, and um, I would have, I've, I've given it to her for the year to, to have a horse, unfortunately COVID set in, and my plans are at the end of the year to breed with her. You know, um, it's enough. She's, she's, she's given me everything. She's an amazing mare. Um, difficult in her own right, but, um, had, I've had a lot of success on her and I, and I love her dearly so it's, it's tough I think at the end of this year she's given me enough and I, I don't want to carry on I think she would if, if all my horses go lame I would be able to, to, to put some work in and get her back into the 150 but I think she's, um, she's given me what she can mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the plan is to breed leads me on to my next question your association with the Keller Hosted um, you mentioned Ian earlier but it's been a, a, a long and fruitful association after that what's involved um, how close do you work with the stud are you involved with kind of any matings any uh, matchups um so I, it's not an association it's a great friendship Ian, Ian Cullen is, is one of my great friends um, a man I, um, I really, really respect. A man that's got, um, what I always say, he's got a size 12 brain. Um, a guy that's figured out, you know, his mother lines has invested heavily in the mother lines. Uh, you know, from a breeding philosophy point of view, um, I can see what he does. It's, it's fascinating to talk to. Um, and our, our, my association with the, and, 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 and link, with the with the Kelo status, first and foremost, he's a, he's my he's my friend. Um, secondly, we have the passion together with the horses. I have this 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 group of mares. I mean, if you think about, um, I've got and it's it's quite a job keeping this family of mine in in one fifty horses. You know, it's it's. I mean, most riders find it difficult just to get a horse for themselves. But I've got Kaylee to keep in one fifties, Thomas to keep in the one fifties. Aisling is going to go into the 150s now. You know, we're trying to sort out a proper string for her. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a lot of mares that are 150 proven mm. mares, you know, with un incredible pedigrees um, and related and back, back in their pedigrees related. For instance, the little mare that Tom used to ride, uh, uh, Charlene, that Kaylee's now riding, that's Chaco Blue. That's um, Chaco Blue uh, for Pleasure Granus. And the Granis mare is Luciana Deniz's, uh, Lennox's mother. Um, you know, the other mare, uh, Fiona, is for pleasure, Cartago Ritual Granos. You know, it doesn't get better than that. The new mare that mm. Kaylee's got also, but uh, is a Lord Z, uh, Cantus Reichsgra um, mm. uh, Reichsgraf mare also. Um, if you go in the mother line, 150 horses. Uh, the Bish is a 150 horse. So there's all these mares there, and so, you know, um, and I've got, I've got the stallion to ride and two mares from, from Ian. I was a bit more heavily involved and uh, with, with the stud and, and more so just keeping, giving feedback to Ian because Ian, Ian likes to sit on the farm. You've got to go and see him. He doesn't come up here. Nobody, hardly, hardly anybody's ever spoken to the man. 
So social distancing wasn't difficult for my friend Ian from the farm. He does that naturally. But uh, I was a little bit more, but you know, I've also got my, I, I also don't carry on doing stuff if I can't do it you know, properly uh, or be the best at it. And I've got my hands for my priority is my family, you know, my wife. Um, I want to get AZ jumping the big classes. Um, I want to get Kaylee back up there where she was with Louisa. She's now got taken over Tom's string. And then obviously Tom's now riding internationally, so I've got to get him. Um, I've got to get him. I've got to stand behind him. So I don't really have much time for, for breeding or getting involved in that. Mm. Obviously, I, I've got a keen eye on what's coming out, and they send me videos of the young stock, and I'm very excited mm. about it. I think this year, again, he was the pioneer of the auction. This year, he's doing an online auction. So we see how that's going to go. Um, I know that they're all sitting on the farm hoping for the best and not, nobody's ever sure what, what, the, what, what the result's going to be. Um, and possibly their best crop, I feel, that they've got this year. And I think they're going. And, and also, you know, I'm also a good friend with Henning. So I think we in South Africa, don't, we've got to be very grateful to these two big breeders for giving us horses that are affordable and pushing themselves as hard. And they've, they've spent fortunes um, on bloodlines, et cetera. And um, we need to be, as riders, we need to be very grateful and we need to support them because they, they are our, our answer to getting over there, buying a good one there and they're coming. I think there are some that are good enough that will, that will go. I mean, I just bought in one that was sold previously, a horse called Sancho, which I think will be a, will be a 150 horse. So there are horses to be found here, yeah, and it's, if I can give anybody advice, um, buy the best you can. Take all your money and buy as young as you possibly can. The best you can buy as young as you can, and then you have a chance of getting that superstar. You know, mm. going horses are are not. Uh, you know, people have already seen them, so they they're invariably. Well, I, I want to talk to you about about a way forward um, in and how we do start fielding teams overseas and, and Tom and what the plans are. But before we we get there. Um, Ian sitting on the farm, and of course you're very friendly with Henning, and you have this wonderful string of, of top quality mares. Are, yeah, so are they I, my deal, my deal is simple. If Ian wants, uh, if Ian wants to, uh, so Ian, Ian would say Ian's already taken embryos. Like I said, he used Electra. My other horse that I jumped for uh, for a season in the World Cups was a mare called Balabushka. Um, she's already given him a foal. There's a mare called Konama that jumped 145. That, it went lame when I got her shortly after I bought her in. Nobody really got to see her. She's also bred there. My old mare Dell's there. So Ian and I's my relationship. I've just bought a stallion. I actually got four stallions that I've just bought because in Holstein you get to buy the best. It's the only place where you get three-year-olds. Every Holsteiner breeder brings his best stallion to show for that licensing and puts it on the auction. So where else do you get with the best? Uh, three-year-olds. You don't. They don't show the best three-year-old mares and then put them on an auction in anywhere, anywhere or best stallions. So that's a place where I believe I could buy um, the best young. Um, so I've actually bought them for competition horses, but I've kept them entire because if something happens, you know, if they turn out to be a good one, then also it's got the horse has got a residual value. You can use a breeding stallion if something happens to him, etc. So I've got. I've got uh, one, two, three, four stallions. Azing's got a stallion there. So I've got five very good young stallions. And as I said, um, my arrangement with Ian is if Ian wants to use any of those, if he wants to do embryos, and I'm sure um, if there's a horse that Ian wants me to ride that he thinks uh, he wants produced or a mare line check to, you know, that's our relationship. But it's really, it's mostly about being friends and enjoying and loving the breeding side of it together. Yeah. I, I, I have, as I said, my business, I don't get any uh, commercial value out of sponsoring. So I ride all my horses under the, under the Kello brand. But are, are, they, are they haggling you to change your mind about harvesting embryos while your mares are still in sport? And I'm pretty forthright. It's no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've laid down the law. Now, a story, a story that, that um, most South African viewers won't know involves uh, your good friend here in this 
wonderful mare that they've got, Lakota, who used to be named Last Flight, who just so happens to be the dam of one of the world's best Clinter. Can you tell us the story and how that all happened? So, um, yes, yeah, so Pierre, Pierre uh, I, I'd already bought Electra from uh, uh, Hilma. So he wanted to know I was there. And there was a very good mare, which you know, Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. Pierre wanted to make a comeback in Tirati. So he said, Go, would you find me a safe one, uh, a nice one, one that'll never say no. And then Cleopatra was standing there. But at the same time, he was there, there was a three-year-old, uh, the mayor just, she just, they just, fought, they had just weaned Clinton. And there she stood, the Lord Petsy, Drosso Klang, Gardulan Mayor, Gardulan Pokal, that's the pedigree. There she stood, and he bought her on a loose jump. She hadn't, she hadn't been under saddle. She just, they'd just taken her, she was, they'd just taken the fall away. She had a great free jump, and Pierre Lepard buys her, and I think Paul Shakamula has been haggling him ever since to do something with the mare. And of course, he's sitting with her down there. I think I've got one cornered demure fall out of her. And uh, yeah, he's, he's, I, saw him, I actually saw her this week. He's standing with another good Lord Petsy, um, uh, La, uh, Lakia. Mm -hmm. the Lakia, the, uh, yes. the mare that jumped with uh, also a very good horse. She's also down there breeding. So Pierre's got a little breeding operation going. So. Went to see him and that was fun. So he's sitting with this magnificent horse. Unbelievable story. Yeah. Gavit, um, you you mentioned Tom and Kaylee quite a few times as a dad, watching your kids come through the ranks. I mean, how much, how proud are you? How much satisfaction? How much reward do you get from uh, seeing them follow in the old man's footsteps? Um, I'm yeah, obviously incredibly proud, and I mean, again, you know, I, you know, people always say to me. You know, you sponsor and you give and whatever to the sport. What has the sport not given me? You know, I've got how many dads can say they can go to a weekend show, spend the whole weekend with their kids riding, riding against them, talking about horses. You know, I've never had with either of them had to have any. I never had any problems with them as teenagers. I never had anything because they were they had found this thing that they loved, this passion that brought us together. Um, that you know we close because of it. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm uh, and uh, I don't think that I think they're going to do a lot better than what I did. I think both of them are much, uh, got a lot more talent. Um, and uh, hopefully, with the experience that I've picked up in terms of traveling and, and sussing out this, this, this sport and the community and internationally, I can help them and I can be of assistance that they could achieve some, some really good things. Mm. So, and at the same time, if they decide that they don't want to do it anymore, that's also fine with me. You know, I love mm -hmm. them dearly. Mm -hmm. They're two great kids and um, we're mm -hmm. good friends. And that's at, the most at the moment, Tom is overseas with Oliver. What is the plan? Is he there to stay or is he going to further his studies? I believe he's going to, he might be going to England to, to study, but he'll continue riding. Yeah, so Tom's actually in quarantine in, in Santon at the moment. So ah, okay. he's come back to renew visas and get things sorted out. But he's been with Oliver Lazarus. Um, he, um, he, had a good, he had a good show in Oliva. He was third in the bronze final, the final week. Um, it was his only show that he's ever ridden in there and then COVID hit. Um, so it's been unfortunate for him. He's got a very nice house, a horse called Gaudi that I bought from As of Shria. Um, and uh, I've got him two more mares. I've got him... Um, uh, Dollar de la Pia, Katago man, and I got him a, a Kazal man, two seven year olds. Um, and I must say, uh, I think that if we think going forward, Oliver Lazarus would be a real opportunity for us to have a base. He's, uh, he's got himself a magnificent place set up. He's, uh, I rode with him in the, in the Nations Cup team. He's a real ambassador for South Africa. He's a good guy. And uh, I think Tom has loved it. I mean, there was even talk about him saying, oh, how far is Maastricht? Maybe I should go to university at Maastricht. And thank goodness he missed the, the cutoff because um, luckily for Tom, he managed to, um, they've got a very good course at the London School of Economics, BSc Finance. They only take 65 in the course in the year. And he managed to get in and got accepted for that course. So he'll be doing, he'll start on the 26th of September at uh, 
London School of Economics with his BSc Finance. Um, I spoke to uh, Robert Whitaker today, um, and it looks like we're probably going to move his horses there. Um, I've spoken to Will Funnel and people, but Robert Whitaker is a little bit closer um, to, to London. Um, it will take him about 45 minutes um, on the tube to get to the centre of London and out. And um, from September, I'll start him um, definitely with two horses. Um, and let's see what, what Varsity So The priority for Tom is to stay in touch. So maybe in his holidays, he can go and ride on the, on the continent. But the main thing is for him to get to, to, to perform academically at uh, London School of Economics and then maybe hopefully do his honours somewhere and then we'll see, we'll take it from there. He then wants to go and ride for a year or two years after he's done his studies. That, that's a possibility. But um, priority now is for him to get educated. A recurring theme throughout the course of these interviews is how does South African equestrian sport, particularly show jumping, attain this dream of having representation at European Nations Cups, getting ourselves to World Games, fielding a team that is not just making up the numbers that could have a competitive uh, chance. Um, how do we do that, Gavit? You're a businessman. We know it takes money. We know it takes riders overseas. Is it at all possible to do it from here if the quarantine regulations open up? Um, how far behind is our breeding? You mentioned um, that, that our breeders, our two big breeders, are doing great things and their female pedigrees are improving. But realistically, how far off of of those top class horses are our breeding operations. What needs to be happen, happen as a collective, in your opinion? I think um, our first problem is, uh, I think we've got a difficulty. We've got to, we've got to address some of our local problems that we have. And I mean, it's always easy to give, to, to point out the obvious and the problems. The solution is, is, is where you, the solution is the, the important part of it. What has happened over time, we have taken our sport away from the public, right? And I'll get to why that is critical. Um, we used to go to the Rand show, to the uh, Pretoria show, to uh, Peter Maritzburg, to the Royal show, and the sport, the Gonda Beatrix age, uh, Peter Gotson, they were household names, they were heroes. They were, mm. Some of them used to be flag bearers for the South African the whole team, the whole South African team, if they had a, if they had an event uh, against uh, whatever Commonwealth event, that's how our show jumpers were revered. It was the sport of kings, and they were, and and it's because it used to be, it used to appeal to the public, because um, it was something to go and see at the Rand Show, and it, and we've taken that away. We've moved to these synthetic services. We jump in our own backyards. We've got our own little clubs here, um, and. Um, if you see what Jan Tops has done with the Global Champions Tour, he's taken it back to the people. You know, he does it um, below the Eiffel Tower where there is a section there where everybody can stand and watch. And that then creates, um, if I bring a sponsor to the Rionet show um, and uh, a potential sponsor and they're sitting around that arena and they're seeing, it's just my family there and the other mm. riders' family clapping, there's no... There's no, um, there's no reason for him to say, well, what do I get? Because not everybody has the same story as I have. They're prepared to give because what horses have given to them. So you have to have something that brings them there that says something. I think the derby would have marketability because when they come there, the atmosphere on the final day is great. But it's our other shows. So I started it. Unfortunately, we've had this COVID thing. But last year, I tried to have you know, some gin stands, some incorporating it with something different. This year I had Jesse Clegg that was, go, uh, Jesse Clegg that was going to come and play um, on the Saturday and the Sunday after the, after the class and have a, uh, a beer on tap and, gin and a family day out because you have to have, you have to have numbers. Numbers attract sponsors, sponsors, give the money, the whole thing grows. And then from there you get, uh, when you have numbers, you have strength, the standard goes up and then you're able to make that, that thing. Now it sounds like it's insurmountable, but it doesn't have to happen independently. I think we really have to focus on getting our sport um, 
we have to market our sport. We have to get it. Polo's done something right. You know, they shipped in the pretty girls and the whatever, and then the, the, the corporates have come in, and that's the sort of theme that they created. And therefore, Investec and all the big corporates, they love going to a, a polo day. We need to do that with our sport to get the corporates in so we get the sponsorships so we get everything. Quarantine, everybody, it is a big thing. I will never send a horse, um, put a horse through what it went through, what Ultra went through, because I didn't have a horse on the other side. I mean, it, it, mm. she just never, I just never got up and running again. Um, and all horses react differently to that. So the quarantine, I believe, will go. I had a meeting with um, uh, uh, Craig, uh, Todd, uh, Adrian. Adrian Todd, I, I had a meeting with him and the, uh, I actually set up the meeting with the Minister of Agriculture and from there the protocols were through around the poultry and all of that was relaxed and we managed mm -hmm. to get them to, to get that open because I do believe that we have horses. Krabat, the horse that I have here, I think is good enough to go and jump over there and there are a lot of young horses that we've got here and riders and something, I mean a horse like Don, there will be another Don Kamaka in the ring. Don Kamaka and his heyday would have been perfect to go overseas mm -hmm. and that's one or two riders. Then we have to draw on the pool of riders that we have there. The biggest problem with that setup is that everybody's on their own mission over there and everybody, nobody, nobody pulls together. The two Nations Cups wouldn't have happened if I didn't push for them. You know, it was a, it was a mission and trying to get the, the South Africans to, to work together because everybody's doing their own thing. I don't even think a guy like Charles Lakes was contacted you know, he's sitting there. I rode against him in, in, in Belgium. He had two wonderful uh, horses there. I think he was placed in the one ranking class, big class. So he had a nice string up and coming. I think Oliver next year will have a great string. And Oliver, Oliver's got aspirations of, uh, I mean, he's done it all. He's really been the one guy that has made it. Um, and uh, he, he, I think next year he wants to do uh, uh, some global tour uh, events. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I think that we've got people there, we've got, uh, it's about galvanizing the people there and working really hard and picking up our standard here and getting our sponsors here. Because as a South African, what do we have, why would somebody sponsor a South African overseas? Why would a European guy, they were going to look at their own countrymen. So, it has to start here. It has to start with us um, getting our sport back to the people. We get more people watching the sport, we get more sponsors. More sponsors we get, um, we can lift the whole game and then it will be, it'll be a possibility to go over there. Mm -hmm. I think, as I said before, we have great riders here, we have very good coaches. Um, we have, it's inexpensive for us to produce our horses. Um, and, um, and there's some real talent, um, and then we, we've got really talented young riders, I believe. Um, and uh, I, I think it. I think it. I think we can pull it together in the next seven mm -hmm. years. But we have to. We have to get the people watching show jumping again. We have to. Who do you think our federation does enough to drive this to push forward development? Can they be doing more? Can we be setting up funds to start now um, as a as a collective? Companies like yourself feed companies, tech companies, percentages of sales go into a fund, percentages of, um, of entries go into a fund so that something is starting to, to, to happen? I think, um, I think, uh, I'm the wrong guy to ask about that. I'm very anti-committees. I'm, I'm very anti-regulation. I'm very anti, um, you know, uh, having, uh, I think that, I think we're, we, we're, what we can do is we need to, um, I don't know if there's events, something, what you're doing here is great because, you know, a lot of people you don't get to speak to, you in and out riding and all that, and they get to hear their point of view. But we have to, I think it starts with every single rider that has a responsibility, every single coach that has a responsibility, every single person to dream bigger that's in the sport, you know. Um, there are people that make a living out of the sport 100% and there are people like myself that just participate because, it, because it's, a, it's our hobby and it's our sport. But every person there in that value chain can do something. If they really sit down, they can do something that can further the sport, that can do something that can make it better for that. There might be... Um, um, 
I think it starts with a showpiece. I think it's about bringing the people. That's why I've taken on that real net show. And that's why I wanted it to be, uh, I wanted to create a show where I can turn it around and I have control. It wasn't going, it was the worst of the World Cup qualifiers. And in that way, try and bring, if there's one or two people there that see this wonderful sport, they've had a wonderful day with their family. It's a good, clean, healthy sport. It is, it's got so many facets to it. If we can expose people to it, I, I can't, under, uh, I can't um, uh, understand why we won't get the support we need. The next thing is, is, that, is that when we deal with people as show jumpers, as, 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 as people in the know with the sport, and we have new people coming in, and this is a real responsibility for coaches, for people that have that responsibility, is to make sure, um, and there's, this is the difficulty, people make a living out of the sport, so, you know, commissions on horses, when they come in, is it the right horse, you know, your responsibility is to keep that person, if you're a professional in the sport, the more people you hold in the sport, the better for you as a profession because, you know, you've got more supply, more access to more funds, and they really have a responsibility. Over the years, if you've seen how many people have come in with real purpose, with real money, they get the wrong horse, they get, the, they get bought the wrong horse, they get advice, the wrong advice, you know, the dad's not a rider, he's, he's burnt all this money, oh, now it doesn't feel, you know, if, if I make a mistake, um, I'm passionate about the horses, whatever. I'm, I'm not going anywhere because it's, I'm, I'm in it. Yeah. But if yeah. you're a dad that doesn't really understand this animal that's costing this much, now this coach or somebody has advised me to buy this horse for, didn't have the credentials to give the right advice. And then the people, you never see those people again. That is such a massive loss to our sport. We need to keep all the people in. So I think every person in the sport and that makes, either makes a living out of it or participates or has the joy of riding, needs to take responsibility and, um, and make sure that they promote the sport, that they, 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 they put their personal feelings, their, their, their differences aside, and that they, you know, they, they, it must look attractive and the people must come in. And, and, and that's where it will all start. To say, um, maybe we will find a benefactor. Maybe, maybe there will be, maybe one of the, somebody will say they want to sell a African team, but I don't think you can, just sit back and wait for that to say that somebody's going to come out of the blue and say, right, I'll put, it, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put 5 million euros on the table and let's go. Let's build a South African team overseas. I don't think it's going. And I think you, it starts here. We need to, each of us, do whatever we can to build our sport, promote our sport. It's a beautiful sport. It's the best sport. Um, and we need to get lots of people interested in it. Mm. And then, of course, uh, move with the times. You know, we're now in a, in a global community with the World Wide Web and things like exactly. live streaming, terrestrial, domestic TV channels are a thing of the past. We have a, a, an opportunity to link up with the Clip My Horse um, formats and, and, and take our sport overseas and, and not just appeal to the bums in the seats that are on the, at the showgrounds, but all of those that might be sitting at home. You know, yes. it's... Uh, different times that we're living in. Gavit, um, final question. You're a, you're a goal-driven man. Some uh, goals for 2021 post-COVID and then a, a five-year plan. You mentioned that you would like to have another crack yourself overseas. And um, how big a dream would it be with, uh, with, with yourself and, and maybe Tom, who's doing things overseas, see you in a nation, the two of you in a Nations Cup team together. How big a dream would, it would, would that be? Oh, that would be unbelievable. And uh, yeah, we, I'm, 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 I'm quietly just plugging away. Yeah, I know where to focus. I've got to focus on the business side of things. You know, um, if, we are, if we're fortunate enough and Rionet keeps growing like it is and some of the other ventures that I've invested in come off, you know, some of them have got international potential. Um, some of them we are going to take offshore at the end of this year. Um, that would be a dream. I mean, I would love to do it with each of my kids. Um, mm. You know, as I know Tom is there and he's studying over there. Kaylee's finishing a degree this year. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd also like to, I'd, I'd like to give her an opportunity to have a, to have a splash for, for myself. Don't, um, don't, for, don't forget about your wife or you're going to be in the dog, uh, in the dog box tonight, eh? Well, no, no, no. Um, Aze is, is there, but... Uh, 
I don't know if Aisha hasn't put her hand up yet for that. I think she's very driven. I think she wants to ride Derby this year um, on Fortune. Yeah. So we're going for that. And definitely, I've got a, she's got a very good mare called uh, Elegen that we also bought from Ernst uh, of Schur that I think she'll do the big stuff in. So you never know. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. Aisha will, will want to um, change her, her focus, will go overseas. For me, I would like to have a season where... Um, I came second to Chris in the World Cup Series last year. He had the phenomenal run, and it's actually quite sad that that partnership has been broken up because, mm. you know, it's good for the sport. I was I was licking my lips for round two. You know, mm. it's always good. And but there will be somebody else. There's so many good riders and good horses for the season. I, I'd, I'd like to have a good season with Volker uh, next year. Yeah, um, I have been over. I went over to look at a nice, uh, a very nice mare. She unfortunately didn't pass the vet to leave over there. And I think that I'll, I've got Anse of Schur looking for me um, for a horse. Um, and it will come. The horse will come. Um, and uh, we know what horse what, what horse needed. And then obviously if it opens up, I'll send Krabat out. Um, and then Krabat can go and join that horse. Um, and then we'll, we'll compete from there. Maybe, um, maybe Oliver's going to be the base for me, you know, in Holland. Um, he's got a beautiful setup there. Spoken to him, and then we can see what happens with Tom. I don't know how uh, how hectic Tom's boss is going to be, um, but if it's if it if it's allowed, I'd like to do a, a little tour with him in his in his holiday next year, and we go around Europe and do some show jumping. So that is a definite goal. Um, as I said, I've got very high hopes for Larison, the capital, uh, the the Kello Stallion. He's a he's a crack of horse. And uh, he's one that I would secret in the back of my mind. I'm hoping maybe that. But once more, I will do it if I have the right horses and it's comfortable. You know, I had to jump Volker in, a, in the in the in the Nations Cup when we did it last time, and it was it was hard work for her. She jumped. She did, she had two down and two down in the two that she jumped. But uh, I mean. It, it's a, it was it's a, it's abusive to jump a horse like that around there. I want to have the right horse where I can sit, and canter quietly down to the big fences and not have to really rev her up and kick and all of that. So, um, yes, I think that uh, definitely some Nations Cups would be in my would be a dream for me. Um, mm -hmm. And then to watch my kids and 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 watch Aze's uh, career flourish and um, do the best they can. It's been wonderful chatting. I've got to take this opportunity to thank you for uh, everything you do for the sport, for your Scott, the contribution that you that you bring uh, on the back of a horse inside of the ring, also through rear necks, also through your breeding. You are really propping up uh, the the bloodlines in South Africa with these wonderful mares and and all your contribution, Governor. It's 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 been great chatting and and thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and we'll see you on the other side. Good to be looking forward to some times back in the ring. That'll be great. Thank you very much. Uh, Enjoy the rest of your Saturday evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.